So, we came together this morning to learn some stuff. Learning is a very important thing. If you want to know what, what it's like to start making things better in the world, you better know what's going on in the world. And uh, two, two months ago, we, we had Rod Kreider talking about economic development here in Rowan County. And la, la, last month, we had uh, Eric Haig talking about inflation. I mean, these are big kind of issue sorts of things that we need to know and understand. Now, today, we're getting into the ideas around what is health care? What is going on in health care? And what are the health needs here in Rowan County? You know, it's one thing to talk about, oh, we should expand Medicaid. Fine. Why? What are the details? Who is in need? How to respond to that? But before you get to the politics of it, you better know the data of it. I recently met, met a guy who said, I am a data-driven Democrat. Well, this is the right place to be if you're a data-driven Democrat because the head of our local health department is a data-driven person. She, she doesn't go any place without her computer. So, so let me introduce Alyssa Harris. You can stand up while I'm talking about you. She is the Count Rowan County Public Health Director. And according to what she tells me, she is supposed to uh, pro prevent illness and disease in Rowan County and promote health and to see to it that Rowan County is a healthy place for people to live and see to it that those conditions which bring health are here in Rowan County. She's got a bunch of degrees in public health. You don't just walk in the door and say, I'm gonna run the health department. <laughs> you know, so, so she is tru truly qualified and she has been, how long have you been doing this? A year and a half, two years? A year and a half. Or uh, just a little over a year as health director. Right, right, right. And so this is the kind of thing you learn as you go. And uh, uh, we're, we're glad that you're in that spot and you're learning and growing. And now you're going to tell us all about how unhealthy, I, I mean, how, <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, Rowan County has a great deal of need in terms of health. And here we get the data person to tell us all about it. So. Um, Take it away, Alyssa. Awesome, thank you so much. So, get the, there we go. Can we turn off the lights, please? Yay, hey. awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for letting me be here with you today. I am very excited. You are actually the first group who gets this presentation. So also bear with me because you are the first group who are giving <laughs> this presentation. Uh, so I am here, I am, uh, as uh, Jeffrey said, I'm the health director here in Rowan County, but I'm also here representing Healthy Rowan. Uh, if you have not heard of Healthy Rowan, Healthy Rowan, I, I wanna say is one of my favorite things. I started working with Healthy Rowan six years ago um, and it has really helped me uh, with my passion of making Rowan County a healthier place to live. Uh, and so Healthy Rowan, those um, icons at the bottom are our executive team. It really is a community coalition to address chronic disease, obesity, but all health issues uh, here in Rowan County. And so my topic today, um, as mentioned, is how healthy is Rowan County and how do we know? Um, you know, as mentioned, I'm a very data-driven person. Uh, we have just completed our one-year community health needs assessment. And so I'll be talking about that data, the primary data that we collected, um, the data that we received from the state, how it all comes together in information that you all can then know and then use uh, in the ways to advocate for better health in our community. And I'm gonna go ahead and put the cart before the horse and tell you where we stand in comparison to the counties that surround us. So unfortunately, well, just a little backtrack, there is something called the County Health Ranking. It comes out every year. Uh, it compares all 100 counties in North Carolina with one being the healthiest and 100 being the least healthy. Um, so we like to look at ourselves and say, all right, no, these metrics are not perfect, but at least everyone is given the same measuring stick so we can compare ourselves to those counties that surround us. Um, so you can see from this, we are currently ranked 61. So we are in the lower half um, in terms of health, in terms of longevity, um, length of life, quality of life, uh, for those people who live in our community. And I, I don't want that. 
you know, just because you live here, the zip code defines how long you're going to live or what your quality of life is. That is a huge place that we can have an impact in. Um, so when you look at us and you compare us to those counties that surround us, um, I always find Cabarrus interesting. Iredell, Davidson, Lincoln, Catawba, Stanley are all ranked better than us. So those individuals have a longer length of life and a better quality of life. I'm always particularly interested in Cabarrus because of Kannapolis. We share a city. Um, it is a stone's throw where we can see, you know, Atrium Ballpark. So why is it that they have better health outcomes than we do here in Roanne? Um, so we'll get a little bit into that story, uh, but I wanted to go ahead and frame that for you is it's not all negative. It's not all, you know, hope is lost, but it's really, really important for us to know where we're standing right now and where we want to go, which is we want to continue to improve. We want to move in the first, you know, half of um, all healthy counties in North Carolina. Uh, and to do that, we have to know the issues. We have to know where we need to make improvements. Um, as I mentioned, we just completed this community health needs assessment, and so we used Healthy Rowan to ensure representation from all communities. Um, it is a regulatory process, if you did not know. Novant Health, our local uh, not-for-profit hospital system, has to go through this to maintain um, that status. And also, as a health department, we have to go through this process uh, for our public health accreditation. Um, and then if you'll notice, three years ago, we actually partnered with the Rowan County United Way. Um, they do their assessment every six years. We're finally, you know, every other cycle with them. So no one was left out, uh, but we do continue this process. So we have our finger on the pulse. Um, it is not a perfect system, and we'll talk a little bit about limitations, uh, but it is a good measure of what's going on in the community. And these are the partnerships that we have in Rowan. Again, not all exhaustive. Uh, but a lot of different partners are at the table who represent a lot of different populations. And we also have community members. And that's really important that we're making sure that all voices, all opinions are heard when we go through this process. Uh, again, benefits, we're ensuring that all partners and all community members, as we're disseminating this information, have a common understanding of the issues, using this as advocacy or a call to action uh, for the community to get involved. It helps us decide, okay, have past efforts made a change in these very important areas. Um, and then it provides that picture of community health. And it tells us what are our perceptions of being a healthy community. It is a very formalized process. And I tell all of this to you so that you understand that as we're thinking about the data, this isn't you know, pulling data to you know, tell a certain story. Um, we all know the, the phrase lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, we try to, to actually go through this process so it's consistent every time. Um, so we are doing using good data to compare to previous years. Um, so right now we're actually in phase seven, which is sharing the results of this process with the community. Uh, but you can see this was a very lengthy process. It lasts over a year. We have community members come and do presentations uh, from, different, uh, from the different focus areas. Um, and we really hope that it's a meaningful process. It's not just supposed to be a report that sits on a shelf. It's supposed to be something that is used and then hopefully creates change for the next time we go through this process. And these are the focus areas that we really drill down on. So we're looking at vital conditions for healthy living. We're looking at health behaviors and how those health behaviors or health factors influence ultimately the health outcomes that we're gonna discuss. Uh, and so you can see that list, uh, we'll, we'll hit on topics for all of these areas. And not only, like I said, we, we get that data from the state, we actually go and ask citizens, all right, what is your, um, what health are you seeing or what, what influences of health are you seeing? What's your health status? And ask some very specific questions about where they think community priorities should be. Uh, and so we took, this has, uh, we have demographic statistics for 1,209 people. We actually hit 1,700 people for the survey, which gives us about a 1% of our county, a little more than 1%, less than two. Um, so we're able to better generalize this data, but there are still limitations. Um, the individuals that we uh, were able to survey, <laughs> it really skews more female, older, whiter, and somewhat wealthier, but overall it does line up more closely with our um, demographics for the community. Uh, so that's important to remember. As I tell you those community survey responses, it's not everybody in the county, it's not necessarily statistically significant, but it is of those people who were surveyed, this is their experience. And I believe that lived experience is incredibly important as we think about programs and policies that help make an impact in health. This is also another, I, you'll see lots of graphs in this data. Uh, this is where the majority of uh, residents or citizens 
uh, were surveyed. So you can see it's primarily um, in those zip codes that are closer to Salisbury, but we did have representation from across the county. Uh, we used partners um, to submit the, or to share the survey, um, but you'll notice the dates of August 1st through November. If you can remember, I try to block it out, but we were going through another COVID wave during that time. So that definitely um, impacted the data that we were able to collect. And we understand this, and there are ways that we're gonna be working on this with focus groups and, and targeted outreach, um, but it is good that we had a, a representation across the community. Uh, and then limitations, as I mentioned, pandemic, I'm just gonna go put that as, a, as an explanation. Uh, primary data is our most recent, so that survey is that finger on the pulse um, but it is not perfect. So we really need to frame it as from those who took the survey when you see those responses. Um, secondary data, so the data from the state is always available on a delay. Um, and so we look at subpopulation uh, and we definitely need more analysis for equity. So really diving in to health disparities by age, by race, by ethnicity, by um, location. And that's something that we're taking and running with um, over the next year. So questions to keep in mind, um, what does this data confirm for you? What surprises you? Where do we as a coalition need to dive deeper? And what calls to action do you see? Um, I have a lot of data to get through. I really like discussion, so I'll be here afterwards. I would ask that you write down your questions to remember them, uh, and I'm fine with sharing these slides afterwards. So if there's any specific data piece you'd like to have, we're an open book. This is your data, you are the community. So starting off is what does Rowan County look like? Who is Rowan County? So looking at our county demographics, 68% uh, white non-Hispanic, 15% uh, black or African-American, and around 10% um, Hispanic um, that was not included in the white non-Hispanic um, category. Um, so we're more closely, we more closely look like Gaston County than Davidson County, but those are the communities that we typically compare ourselves to. Um, compared to the state as a whole, we're a little more white, a little less um, African-American, but on track or in line um, with our Hispanic community. We look at age demographics. Um, it really spans that life cycle and we'll kind of look at diving deeper into those age groups. Um, we are still seeing a projected and anticipated graying of Rowan County and we'll take a look at that. Um, when we look at age demographics under 17, it's pretty even when I was digging into how many births happened in, in those age groups, um, but we've actually seen a, a decline in the birth rate. So overall, we are seeing less individuals have children or have multiple children uh, per woman um, in Rowan County. Uh, when we do look at our birth rate, it's very skewed uh, based on race. So our Hispanic population is our fastest growing population here in Rowan County, and we can definitely see that with the birth rate um, that's about double that of white and about 1.5 um, that of our African-American non-Hispanic population. When we look at the other side, so our um, older adult population, 65 and older, um, this is actually on trend for what was predicted. We will continue to see more individuals age, and that's why it's so important to make sure that we are aging healthy or in a healthy way. It's not about an A1C or a BMI or any of those acronyms. It is about having a functionally healthy life um, and being able to live and do the things that you want to do to play with grandkids and not feel sick. Um, and to go about your life. And that's why we focus on age, it's not, uh, and it's also to make sure we're bringing in resources appropriately. Um, you'll see some maps like this throughout the data presentation. Uh, so we did do some uh, GIS tracking, and so the dark purple is where we're seeing more of our older adult population um, in the community. And this is great, so we know where to target resources. Um, so you see there's close to um, Kannapolis, and then on the other side, um, I, I couldn't tell you exactly what those zip codes are because they're census tracts, um, but you can see like where those are located. When we think about life expectancy, as I mentioned, Rowan County does have a lower life expectancy, when we talked about that county health ranking, than those counties that surround us. Um, and we've seen a, a traditional split, uh, females typically have a, a longer life expectancy than males and that rings true for our community as well. Um, and again, it's not just we want people to get to a certain age, we want them to live a healthy life um, as they are aging in our community. For Healthy North Carolina, there are these big objectives. The target is to reach an 82-year-old um, life expectancy, and right now Rowan County is definitely below that at 75.4. 
All right, so that was the demographics of Rowan County, who is Rowan County. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about vital conditions for healthy living. Um, so you guys have already talked about inflation and you've looked at um, some economic development. We'll get into that a little bit and I may skip through some slides here knowing what you guys have already heard. When we look at socioeconomic factors, so these factors, when someone has a well-paid job, they have benefits, um, they have access to food, they have graduated high school, um, all of those lead someone to live a healthier life. Uh, and so we look at our trends and when we look at those socioeconomic factors, Rowan County is actually getting better over time. Um, and so that's great to hear. We do see that our uninsured population has maintained the same. Um, so we have a large group of people, 14% of our community, who does not have access to, to healthcare and does not have access to insurance. Um, and so that's really unfortunate when we think about the downstream effects of not having insurance um, and the potential of bankruptcy due to medical costs. We look at employment. Um, the majority of our folks are employed in healthcare, social assistance, and manufacturing, with the third being retail trade. Again, we know that the EDC is working to ensure that new companies, or we hope they are, um, that are coming in provide a livable wage with good benefits because that's what we want to see um, you know, as we look at the, the big picture of someone spending um, from their, their uh, occupation. Median household income has increased over time. It is still lower than the North Carolina average. And we also know with inflation that someone's income is uh, not going as far as it once did. Uh, and so we saw that actually come out in our household food insecurity question from that survey, where we had 80% of respondents saying that they didn't have an issue, but one in five or about 20% saying that they did have a food uh, insecurity issue. Um, whether they were worried about not having enough food, which leads to chronic stress, they didn't have enough uh, money for food or they had to cut meals uh, because of you know, having that food insecurity. Unemployment rate, I'm not a huge fan of this slide because it has fluctuated so much since the pandemic. Uh, we're in a very weird spot when it comes to unemployment. Um, that 2020 spike is from um, the pandemic. And part of the Healthy North Carolina 2030 objective is actually to reduce the disparity um, for unemployment. So that's something that we're gonna be digging deeper in. Is there a difference between race and ethnicity um, for unemployment and how can we help the community understand that difference um, and, and advocate for policies that will help make a change? We look at our vulnerable populations. So these are individuals living below the poverty threshold. Um, again, Rowan County is ranked higher than the North Carolina average, but it is on a slight decline. Uh, our numbers were 15.9%. Um, we're lower than the target average across the state, uh, but still, that's a large piece of our population. I think, what is it, 11% or 13% is one in eight. Um, so more than one in eight individuals living in poverty here in Rowan County. And then we also can split this down by race and ethnicity. Um, again, a goal of ours to ensure equity. Uh, poverty in Rowan County is not affecting everyone equally. Um, so higher percentages of people living in poverty are either American Indian and Alaskan, and our Hispanic population accounts for one third, or one third of our Hispanic population is living in poverty. So I think that that is incredibly important when we think about that as the fastest growing population and also the population um, who's most likely to, to be impoverished or living below the poverty line. And this is where poverty is located here in Rowan County. A lot of it is concentrated um, along I-85. Um, so again, if you want these slides, we'll, we'll send them out so you can take a, a deeper look at this. We have vulnerable populations, so we do look at things like individuals experiencing homelessness, and I do have good news for this. In working with Rowan Healthy Ministries, we have seen a decline in individuals experiencing homelessness, and a lot of that is due to um, the Rowan Healthy Ministries policies and programs around getting people into housing. Um, so that's fantastic. We know we'll continue to see that. Um, it was actually 2021 was half of what 2020 was. Uh, so that's great news. Um, but we know when we've talked about median income, we're also looking at things like rent, we're also looking at um, housing inequality. Uh, rent has continued to increase over time without that um, same increase for wages. Uh, and we are looking at things like crowding for houses. Um, do we have appropriate uh, septic systems? Do we have um, you know, uh, overcrowding or lack of kitchens, and we have all of that in Rowan County. So we really do uh, need to continue to address the housing crisis uh, from both reducing rent and also ensuring that livable housing is available 
Um, and so Rowan County, it's a little bit above the, the target for healthy NC2030, but we can always do better. We look at transportation. The majority of Rowan County residents are driving alone. Um, and I'll show you some other slides about um, access to, to recreation and um, physical activity that really drive home this idea that not everyone has an equal and equitable access to the services that we provide in our community. 6.2% uh, of our households do not have access to a vehicle. So utilizing the transportation system, which is not um, able to reach all these areas, is so important that we're looking at and addressing. Um, so about 83% are, are, like I said, driving alone. Internet access continues to increase in line with other community or with other um, counties and with the state, but still one in five households does not have internet. Um, and I know that there's a big push with broadband. I really hope that the next time we do this assessment, we see that number continue to decrease because the internet has become ubiquitous for everything in our community, for our children, uh, for being able to have a job. I mean, that's, that's an incredible number, thinking 20% of our people do not have um, households with, uh, or are in a household without internet. Our index crime rate, um, despite what you may hear, um, because I think that there are a lot of different narratives, we are seeing a decrease um, for that index crime rate. That doesn't mean the problem has gone away. That doesn't mean we don't have work to do, um, but it is nice to see overall we are seeing that decrease. Um, and it is also less than uh, the North Carolina average. So we want to ensure that we are looking at violent crime because the chronic stress of living in unsafe neighborhoods causes anxiety, depression, accelerated aging, um, and overall harming health. So when we think about health, we have to think about the prevention of violence. And the fear of violence keeps people indoors, keeps people from being physically active, um, from accessing healthy food, and reduces the time spent among neighbors and friends, which we know community connection is so important. And we saw that, that drop during COVID. Um, and we know that we have to build that neighborhood back. We saw domestic violence. We saw an increase um, in 2020, which is what we was reported um, due to COVID, people being indoors. Um, we also saw that fewer people were reporting. So we think that this, we believe that this is underreported. Uh, and that's, it's showing about 0.4% of our population has experienced domestic violence with most of the services going towards court and advocacy. When we asked citizens about this, 11% actually reported um, experiencing abuse in the past year. So 0.4% being reported at state data, 11% from our community survey, which skewed um, white, uh, female, slightly more wealthy. So it's really interesting to see that disparity um, and understanding that maybe the domestic violence count is not capturing all of the abuse that uh, potentially is happening in our community. So those socioeconomic factors, um, now we're gonna talk about health factors, um, access to medical and dental care and health behaviors that lead to whether or not someone's going to live a healthy life. So healthy eating, most respondents said that they um, did eat fruits and vegetables. Uh, what we saw uh, in that other from this question was that people were concerned about COVID and that is why they weren't going to the grocery store, which led them to have fewer or less access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So the impact of COVID, although we don't see it in the data yet because it's removed 2019, in this, that community survey, um, we see a lot more of, of that impact and, and the unintended consequences of the rock and ripple effect um, of everything that surrounded COVID. Uh, and then we also asked about food insecurity, transportation access. Um, there, you know, we have a higher uh, amount of our population with no car and low access to a grocery store. Uh, and uh, we also saw um, that for a low income population, we did have less um, who were, uh, let's see, within that one mile for urban areas or 10 miles within the rural areas for a supermarket. And I'll show some maps that will help make that make more sense. Um, we know that the target is increase, or is 5%. We have 9% of our population without access to healthy food. So definitely an area we can continue to work, whether that's with corner stores, advocating for more grocery stores, um, and access in general um, to healthy food, and less access to fast food or, or more unhealthy food. Um, and I love maps. So this actually shows us access to grocery stores. So 27.7% of our population is within one mile. Um, and these areas that are darker have more health needs. So you can see there are no grocery stores in that area where um, I think that's Gold Hill. And there are fewer grocery stores where people have access um, in Salisbury, which is the opposite of what you would think. Um, but 
2% of our population is within one mile of a fast food restaurant. Um, so when we think about how do we make the healthy choice the easier choice, well, if you are working two jobs, or even if you're working one, if you don't get enough sleep, if you wake up late, you're more likely to go to McDonald's or Bojangles, get those two biscuits, starting off your day with food that is higher in fat and sodium, which is just going to cascade your day, uh, make you feel worse, less likely to go outside and walk, more likely to go and get more fast food for lunch because again, you were running late. And it is this do negative domino effect um, that happens because it is so ubiquitous and access is there. So that's the healthy food side, which is one piece of it, but we also know physical activity is the other side of things. When we talk about health factors. Um, only 18.3% of respondents from our survey are reaching the CDC physical activity recommendation of 150 minutes of exercise per week. So that's 30 minutes, uh, five days a week. Uh, and so we wanna continue to, to impact that. So we asked, well, what prevents you uh, from being active? The majority of folks said things like time, motivation, family um, obligations, or that they were physically unable. Um, so really that physical un or inability to exercise due to disability is a huge issue um, that we need to think about when we talk about access to care or access to physical activity. It's not just, hey, are you going to do it? It's, are you able to go and exercise? Um, and so from those other responses, we've got arthritis, disability, um, again, kind of preventing ac um, access to physical activity. And when we look at the goal is 92% of our population has access. Rowan County is ranked at 61%. So a lot of room to grow um, in that area. Uh, and I, I love, again, maps. Um, so 19% of our population is within one mile of a park. We're like, okay, great. Well, green space really promotes mental and physical health. So how can we encourage more green space? How can we encourage access to green space? We do have a, a larger portion of our population with access to recreation facilities, um, as you can see on this map, and even more of our population um, is within one mile of a trail or greenway. So kudos to Rowan County, to the city of Salisbury for making sure that we have that access. Um, but access is not the same for everyone. Um, only 14 of, or 15 of 47 facilities, um, we actually have transportation to. So again, thinking about that disparity, thinking about access, it's not just, hey, are you close by? It's can you get to it? Um, and so knowing that really um, the transit system does not go out into those other places within the community, that's gonna have a huge impact for access. All right, so moving on from physical activity, from healthy eating, let's get into health insurance. Um, so our percent under eight, 19 years of age um, with uninsured or who are uninsured has remained pretty stable alongside um, the North Carolina average. We do want to continue to see that go down. Um, uninsured under 65 has risen and we know the uh, pandemic had an impact in that as well. Um, the target is 8% and right now Rowan County is at 14.6%. So again, thinking about that trickle down effect, if you don't have insurance, if you're less likely to go receive preventative care, you're going to end up with more serious health out or issues later on that could have been prevented. Um, and so, you know, that's, we'll see that in some of the, the future maps. Primary care workforce, um, we're still lower than the North Carolina average, but doing okay. Um, we had 7.7 .7 primary care providers per 10,000 of our population uh, not having access to a doctor in our community, and we're going to see more primary care physicians retiring in the next two years um, really has an impact because delay, um, or it could prevent people from seeking preventative care in general. Um, so we don't want to see that more, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Same thing for our dental care workforce. Um, we do have lower than the North Carolina average. I will say we had Dr. Brett Leslie, who is the uh, dentist or the dental lead at the community care clinic, which is our local free clinic, um, talked about it's not just do we have dentists, it's are they, do they say they take Medicaid patients and then are they actually taking those Medicaid or Medicare patients? So those types of systems level work really need to be looked into um, because they can say it, but when it comes time to actually having those open appointments, the availability isn't always there. Uh, we ask people, what is your barrier um, to, to care, in, uh, both medical care and other care? Uh, and so you know, the majority of people are going to the doctor's office. We still are seeing people go to urgent care or the emergency room, which we want them to get away from. That is not the most appropriate or best care that they're gonna receive 
for a preventative um, issue. Uh, we do know that some of these did overlap. We asked about, did anyone have a problem um, getting any of the healthcare services? Um, and the other needs included not having access to mental health care, huge need, um, accessing health care only to the emergency department because they did not have insurance, and then cost being the big barriers. Um, but you can see these other barriers. Most people said dental services they didn't have access to, um, or primary care, um, and then prescription medications, likely due to the cost. And then finally, we asked, well, what has prevented you or someone from using your healthcare services? And again, financial and the cost of healthcare services came back as, as the number one. We did have some um, interesting responses that fear or COVID-19, underinsurance and difficulty, finding a provider or scheduling an appointment were all included as barriers to accessing the care that they currently have or pay for. Um, and so I think we'll continue to see the impact of COVID, again, that rock and ripple effect. Uh, we'll, we'll potentially see more cases of breast cancer, or more cases of illnesses that could have been screened for um, that were not because people weren't going to the doctor um, during COVID-19. And I'm gonna skip ahead. Um, we are lower for our early prenatal care. Um, that's a really big piece. And there's also a, um, a racial disparity that exists um, that our uh, African-American moms are less likely to receive prenatal care and our uh, mothers who are on their second child are less likely to access prenatal care. Um, so that's an area that we definitely need to work on. So the, the grand finale is our mortality and morbidity. And so looking at where chronic disease is and what are the leading causes of death here in Rowan County. Um, so maybe no surprise, um, this does not include COVID-19, which will likely be its own category next year when we see that data come through. Uh, but cancers and diseases of the heart um, still are the top leading causes of death here in Rowan County. Number four, I want to point out other in unintentional in, um, injuries. So things like overdoses were a rising and leading cause of death. Um, so we saw more of that than we have in previous years. Um, and we do have funding coming in to address that, but I, I did want to call that out. Um, we saw some decrease, um, stroke decreased, Alzheimer's decreased, diabetes, but pneumonia and influenza increased, which we may see some early signs of COVID um, in, the, in those numbers. And then, of course, my graphs. Um, so this is where COPD is mostly located. Again, these maps will help us identify where we need to take resources or how we can target populations to ensure that they understand where they can go for care um, or figuring out the other barriers, transportation, financial. Um, so you can see the, the darker colors indicate that there are more cases of COPD or more prevalence of COPD in that area. Um, and then we see that same by cancer. Um, so interesting, these are also the um, census tracts where we saw more aging populations also aligns with those um, census tracts for more prevalence of cancer. Uh, and then this is heart disease. And then finally, we have an overall health needs index priority area. So the red areas are truly the priority areas um, that the state has helped us identify that we, we need to go and target and focus um, for those communities to ensure that they have equitable and equal access to care um, and to resolve um, the issues that uh, we're seeing. So I'm going to skip that to get to just talking briefly about um, what we're seeing for obesity. We have actually seen a decrease in that trend, which is fantastic. Um, continuing to see that uh, is really, really important for us. We're trying to track alongside the North Carolina 2030 objective. Um, childhood obesity has also declined. Um, this is specifically within our WIC program. Uh, we're working with other uh, physician offices, provider offices to get the full picture. Um, but most children who are involved in these programs are actually a healthy weight, which is fantastic. Um, substance use, so medication and drug poisoning deaths, this should not be surprised based on that previous data. Um, we have continued to see one of the greatest increases. This, the goal is 18 per 100,000 and Rowan is at 47. So this is absolutely a priority area um, that we are trying to work on. And the majority of our unintentional overdose deaths are attributed to heroin and other synthetic narcotics. Um, and then for this, uh, this just shows you who is that majority population. And so for us in Rowan County, um, it is uh, highest among males, individuals between 25 and 40 
five and non-Hispanic um, American Indian and white population. Uh, so we'll continue to, to monitor that and that allows us to know who to target uh, for programs and prevention. Um, we asked a lot of questions about mental health. Mental health, especially those impacts of COVID. Um, half of residents reported wishing that they or someone in their household could talk to someone about mental health. Half of our respondents. That is incredible. Um, so that is an incredible need that we have. A lot of individuals selected anxiety and depression. Um, we saw our suicide rates. Rowan County actually has one of the higher suicide rates in comparison to the state and the counties that surround us. Um, we were at we have seen a slight decline, but we're at 17.9 per, per 100,000, uh, whereas the target is 11.1 .1 or fewer. Um, we actually had recent suicides in the last quarter, I think of two um, individuals who were under 18. Um, and so knowing that that issue is still going on uh, is very, very important for us to address with our community partners. Um, and we also see that there is a significant um, amount of abuse and neglect happening in our community. Um, we continue to see an increase, although slightly lower than the North Carolina average, um, and an increase in children who are um, being placed into foster care. And from our DSS, our Department of Social Services partners, over 90% of our foster care pl placements are due to substance use involvement. So again, all of these are overlapping. Those individuals who are experiencing placement in foster care, those foster care parents are fantastic. It still has caused trauma, which then uh, perpetuates and, and has that domino effect of all those other chronic conditions um, down the line. So finally, we asked citizens, these individuals who took the survey, what did they see as the top priorities, their top three uh, for community concerns? Um, the number one was crime and violence, uh, followed by substance use and poverty. Um, so that is what your local constituents, your citizens are concerned about. Um, as of the survey, following that, housing, mental health, chronic disease and obesity, and then discrimination and racism in our community. Um, so those very important pieces to understand so we know where the pulse is and where people are concerned. Um, for your priorities for the next year, and you might say, Alyssa, it is 2022, and it's halfway through 2022. Why are we talking about 2021? Well, it's a year-long process. We collected the data in 2021, so we call back to 2021 as um, where the priorities were selected. The last time this happened was 2018. Um, so we reviewed all of that data and even more in depth at Healthy Rowan. Um, and so the community selected substance use, mental health, and healthy lifestyle behaviors with a foundation and access um, and those social determinants or vital conditions. Um, that's what that bottom piece means. Um, as the areas that as a community, we really need to delve into and look at. Uh, and so next steps, we're doing this, um, my uh, publicity campaign or publicizing and distributing this data. Um, but what I ask of you all is to, to get involved, to find a way um, to help make an impact um, in these statistics. In the next three years, I will come back and provide this presentation again. And I really hope that we've moved the needle um, in these areas in an important way. And that is it. Yeah. <laughs>